So I, I'll start, and uh, if something isn't clear, just stop me, shout, say something. Um, usually people start this talk by either bringing a, a verse from Hebrews or, or speaking from a Christian perspective. Um, I'm going to start with the secular idea of what faith is, psychology of faith. And what I'm about to get to share with you today is six stages of faith that come from a man called Fowler. And those apply to whatever faith tradition you might belong to. Um, they apply to the Christian as much as they would to the Jewish, the, the Buddhist, the Hindu, or whatever. So the first stage is known as intuitive projective faith. It's generally there with pre-age school children who hear a story and they can't really um, think about it rationally. It's mostly about the impressions of the story. It's not for them to um, spend their time, you know, thinking is this story true historically or not. That's not where they are. They're all about the impression they get from the story or from their parents as they tell them stories. Second stage is for those children who are between 6 and 12, and it's the mythic literal. Uh, at this time, children are able to work that out. When you tell them the story of the Good Samaritan, they're aware it's not particularly a historical story, uh, but they're able to still gain some knowledge out of it. Between the ages of 13 and 18, they go through what is known as the synthetic conventional faith. It's not my faith, it's the faith of everybody. What does the group think? What does the church think? What does the parish think? Everything else is secondary. It's all about the collective at this age. Uh, which makes sense because 13 to 18 is the age of teenage years. You're trying to fit in and so on. Um, following that, um, yeah, sorry. we go to what is known as individuative reflective faith. That is between ages 18 to 22. A person is in university. They're questioning assumptions about faith. And they're not content with Sunday school and the answers it used to give. It's at this stage that you are either lucky to see people who are in the second, the, the following stage, which is stage five, or you end up seeing back people, sorry, you end up seeing again the people in stage three who are not concerned about their own developed faith, but are rather concerned about the faith of the group as a whole. Um, if you, however, see a person who's in stage five, who's already have a personal faith, they are in a comfortable place, they know that this is their own personal faith, their own personal understanding of who God is, it is when you see them that you hear answers that are satisfactory, or you come to realize that the one answer, that there is no one answer that fits all or answers all questions. Stage six is uh, universalizing faith, and this is a rare one, it's kind of the saintly kind of person that lives entirely to carry out their mission of faith. To use someone from the Christian tradition, maybe someone like St. Teresa from the Catholic Church who dedicated her entire life around the mission of living out her faith. Now, again, I'd like to remind you this applies to just for the Christian. I used Christian examples because they hit home, but it's for every faith. Now, let's look at the Christian side of things. Faith is doing. Um, the word faith, as it's used in, in the, the Bible, the Christian tradition, it's to be persuaded, but it's also to come to trust. And I'm going to come back to the part of coming to trust later on. Faith is very obvious to us in the baptismal rite. In the, in the Orthodox rite, you face West, and that's where you renounce Satan, known as the Avalos, literally the one who divides. Then you turn around toward the East, toward Christ, and you start saying the creed of faith. And that is known as the symbolon, this which brings together the articles of faith. So you go from one side to the other. It's doing, it's moving in another direction. If we use Hebrews 11.1, 1, which is the classic verse to use in a, in a talk about faith, it's actually faith is the assurance is a very bad translation. It's more of the under, underlying reality, the hypostasis, of the things hoped for. We don't have a set of facts. It's a real hope. Our faith is in a person that is Christ himself. Uh, Galatians 5, 6 uh, and, and James 2, 17 work together, which is quite ironic. Modern scholarship would try to uh, make us think that what Paul thought of faith is different from that which James thought about. But really at the end of the day, they all insist on faith that works through love. And they all insist that faith without works is dead. 
um, true faith cannot but bring a uh, good fruit of work. Now, the world around us, however, is utterly faithless to a large extent. We are bombarded with sexual fluidity, which I don't need to start on that. Uh, there's gender inequality, goes in all kinds of direction. If you're outside of North America, if you go, for example, to the Middle East, inequality is really there in the sense of um, women being persecuted, women being looked down upon, assaulted in the streets. Uh, if you go to North America, sometimes you'll see elements of that. You'll sometimes see elements of the opposite, where we can do everything without men and let's get rid of men kind of narrative. Child abuse and domestic violence is everywhere. Human trafficking and child abductions are everywhere. Statistically, a child that does not come back within 24 hours is probably never going to come back. Um, there's like a 90% chance of that. Um, rape is everywhere, unfortunately. Racism, uh, and we've seen the states and all that's been happening there recently. Secularism, all of that is probably inviting us to one of two things, either to lose faith or try and, and figure out our faith, figure out how our faith makes a difference in the light of all of this not. And it is then that we need to realize the importance of faith preservation. First of all, I need to remind you of the very start where we looked at the stages of faith. Look at where you are. Look at yourself. Are you in stage five where you probably should be? Or are you in a lower stage of faith? And if you're in stage five already, then it's time to work on your faith preservation. And I would think that there are four major elements or five major elements by which we can preserve our faith. The first is living sacramentally, realizing that the sacraments aren't about spending two hours behind a priest in a church uh, praying a liturgy. Yes, that's an important part of it. But living sacramentally involves every single movement and every single piece of food you eat or every drink you, you have and you ingest. It's about realizing that on Wednesdays and Fridays, fasting might be an element of that because you're kind of letting creation rest, which is the theme that's been there since the Old Testament. Um, living prayerfully, realizing that, again, prayer is not just about being in church for two hours every week. Um, to be prayerful is to be always mindful of the presence of God. I think a very good person to go to for that is Sam Maximus, the confessor, in his 400 chapters on prayer. Um, living peaceably. St. Paul says, as much as possible, live in peace with everyone around you. Sometimes people think that witnessing to their faith is manifested through rioting and, and causing problems. And some, it's what I like to call the, the pseudo John the Baptist complex, when the person thinks they have to go and, you know, call everybody a brood of viper and, and, and a serpent and so on. That's, that's not really what it's about. I mean, I'm not saying don't have views. I'm not saying don't have um, a favorite candidate to vote for in the United States, even if you live in Canada, but, you know, maybe be uh, mindful and respectful to everybody who has a contrary view to yours. That might be a way of preserving faith instead of making your life about online arguments, right, left, and center. Finally, it's about living in Christ. Ultimately, Christ is the most faithful. And here it's, uh, I use faithful not in the sense of coming to be persuaded of something, but rather coming to trust if someone ever trusted to the end, it is Christ. He's in Gethsemane, knowing he's about to die, about to be sent over to be killed, yet he trusts the Father to the end. And I think that is where Christianity is different in terms of implementing those stages of faith that I started with. In other religions, the stages of faith are about you trying to reach for God. But in our faith, it is God himself who becomes human and lives out faith, becomes the most faithful, that you don't need to figure out how to be faithful. You simply need to be in Christ. And to be in Christ, it's by living sacramentally, prayerfully, and peaceably. To God be glory now and ever. Amen. And that's it. Yeah, if anyone has questions, comments, disagreements, please do them peaceably. <laughs> no, 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 just you speak it. Um, <laughs> at the beginning of your talk, you, you uh, spoke about secularism or that, that 
you 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 use Christianity because that is what we can um, perhaps better understand. But you indicated that everyone is the same. This development from young to stage mm -hmm. five mm -hmm. is um, experienced by other faiths, other you know Buddha Buddhists or Islam or other Christian sex other than mm -hmm. um, orthodoxy. So how can one peace, peaceably speak mm -hmm. without raising all the various issues that are brought up as differences? Mm -hmm. how, how best to discuss the common um, maladies that we have rather than getting into arguments? Two people come to mind when it comes to that question. One is Paul, the other is Justin Martyr. Uh, Paul with the uh, the unknown God, the altar of the unknown God. He walks around, he's about to go preach somewhere. Everybody there is about philosophy, about being Greek. And I'm not sure orthodoxy is about much now, but being Greek to a lot of people, but that's a different story. Um, in, in, a, in a very real way, he connected with these people through revealing to them the unknown God. Now, chances are their theology of the unknown God was absolutely something completely different from whatever Paul was preaching to them. But the idea is he was looking for a common ground. And then the other person being Justin the Martyr, and I think he's very important in the sense that he, so there, there are two extremes, I think. One extreme is we're all the same. And the other extreme was taken by someone like Tertullian, who's like, anything that is not Christian is pagan and is demonic. I think a good middle ground comes from someone like Justin the Martyr. It's like, it's like, other religions have seeds of the logo, seeds of the revelation, elements of it. Maybe these are things to realize when you're dealing with the person. I think it even changes your mindset. It's not that I'm saving this heathen. <laughs> it's more of I'm connecting with this person using the elements that are common between us in order to lead him to what I have that he or she might not have. Mm. So ultimately, every religion has a sense of hope, a sense of waiting for something. Sometimes it will be the Messiah, sometimes it will be Nirvana, sometimes it will be the second coming and so on. Maybe use that, but then make them realize it's much more concrete than Nirvana. And maybe it's much more real than simply someone that makes Israel be the, the best nation in the world that's free mm -hmm. from all persecution and that it's about much more than that. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's there that people come to the realization that, wait a second, those Christians aren't people that are telling me that I suck and that I need, you know, to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and that's the only way for me to be a good person. No, it's actually more of inserting that person into the narrative of the people of God. So essentially, it's um, a starting point is, is building a relationship yep. with that person based on what you have in common because ultimately you will have something in common even right. if if someone is an atheist well you have your your probably your thinking if you're if you come from the same culture you have your thinking right. along the same lines it, you probably have emotions that are connected you probably even have you know sometimes i'll borrow that from father and jeffrey sometimes you, their idea of god is precisely the god you don't believe in and that can be a common root you tell them what do you think god is and they think of an old man that resembles Zeus or God in the Sistine Chapel, if you will, mm -hmm. and who, who's about to send thunder upon people and being so angry. And, and, and that's their idea of God. And once mm -hmm. they say that, I'm like, thank God I don't believe in that God. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be the starting point. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the, the most important is to not be condescending. And it's very easy for a Christian to come off as condescending mm -hmm. uh, when they're looking at the person as that lost sheep that I'm getting into the herd of God. Kind of. Any other question from our uh, online friends? Hi, Andrew. Yes. Okay, uh, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of those stages that you talked about, especially the young ones up to the uh, 18, 19, 20, how how do we articulate like living a sacramental life or living a life that is in Christ in a practical manner? 
I mean, if there is an age where this works, it's today. Everybody's about the environment, about saving the planet. And if you make people, you know what? That can be the, the entrance, the entrance point. Talk to them about our idea of the kingdom is doing everything as God intended it to be, living in the kingdom, going back to that state of Eden where we are the stewards of creation rather than the abusers of creation, and then bring Christ into that bring the fact that he, in his humility, he doesn't only become human like us, he even becomes in the most humble form of food and drink of bread and wine, and that we give thanks even for that bread and wine, and, and we offer this back to him. Once, once people hear things in that, in that light, realizing that there is a greater narrative than themselves in which we are the kingdom of God, they might be persuaded. They might think it's foolish, but at least you've done your part. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Has questions? I'm not sure if I so much have a question as a comment that um, I think it's a very good, thoughtful challenge uh, for those of us who would like to be bold enough to consider ourselves at stage five. Um, to actually work at the, um, whatever you call it, the perpetuation stage, uh, you know, to stay fresh, if you want to call it that, you know, to, to keep, keep it alive and to still be able to grow deeper in our faith and our relationship with God. It's a good challenge. Maybe even a better challenge is to universalize faith and make it, you know, everything about your life. And look, Mother Teresa wasn't a particularly like a priest. <laughs> she wasn't uh, when she chose to go and serve, like she didn't become a nun in order to serve. She wanted to serve, became a nun, then found the way to serve. Uh, to use another example of someone they call now the Mother Teresa of Egypt is a lady with the name Mama Maggie, who went to the, the Mount of Mokattam, which is a mountain in Egypt. And that area has nobody who's at that point who was above the line of poverty. Uh, they are the people required to collect garbage from all over Cairo. They bring it back to that mountain. They start separating it because the notion of recycling does not really exist in Egypt. So they do the separation of uh, the different kinds of, of waste and that's that was how they made their living and lo and behold that lady showed up who realized after after being just like anybody else a lay woman in the world working she realized i need to go and serve these people and today she has a whole bunch of orphanages and, and a bunch of like different uh, shelters for people and served everybody and made that her life you, you talk to her about herself, she talks about them. You talk to her about herself, she talks about Christ. I mean, that can be any of us, really, if you think about it, because that, that woman is not part of a holy order. Uh, she's, not, she's not far from where any of us are. She just heard the calling and she just said yes. Yeah, I think that could be related to the, uh, the idea or concept that monastics talk about in redeeming the time and making every moment worth it in terms of redeeming time itself and redeeming our actions um, mm -hmm. for the sake of Christ. Yeah. Speaking of that, there's a good book uh, written by someone from our faculty, um, Nicole Rocas, Time and Despondency. It's all about that, redeeming the time. Hmm. Yeah. Anyone is interested in, in the concept. And, and she speaks about it in a very non-monastic way, which makes it very relatable to us. I think that's a very important thing. Is, is she and her husband the ones that do the, um, the, yep. the doubt podcast? Yep. Yeah, so help my unbelief. <laughs> yeah, that, that one. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's that. All right. I'm thinking it's a good time to...
get things to an end and say bye to everybody and until next week. <laughs>